Okay, for the too long didn't read types of individuals, uh, you're not going to really like this. Um, what I'm going to do is go over the documents that I thought had some significance to the case from start to end, which are a lot, <laughs> which may consist of a lot of videos, and I'm just going to read what they say and comment on them um, uh, with reference to what I've already have concluded. <coughs> of course, I'm going to you know, if I find anything that um, contradicts what I've said, you know, either I'll change my mind or or think about what the explanation is. So to go over it, I, I said that basically um, at the height of the German scare, um, at a time when um, J. Edgar Hoover reobtained the power or desire to start keeping dossiers of people inside his FBI files, which was actually in 1939. Uh, one of the first dossiers that was thrown into the file was this um, memorandum written by Mr. Tam <coughs> that um, it says the attached anonymous memorandum contains information Concerning a Mr. and Mrs. Kuhn and the Hawaiian Islands who believed to be espionage agents, uh, the information was transmitted to me by Blank, who in turn received the information from some other guy, and uh, friends of his in the Hawaiian Islands who desired to remain anonymous. So this is secondhand information. Um, okay, I have known Blank for some years and have found him to be thoroughly reliable. We know he's a male. That eliminates half the population. Uh, the information is being transmitted to the Army and Navy intelligence units and will likewise be furnished to the San Francisco office for appropriate attention when an agent is next in the Hawaiian Islands. Now, earlier I said that you know, at this time, the FBI didn't have a Hawaii office. What I didn't say later was that <coughs> eventually they did get a Hawaii office. And one of the reasons for the opening of the Hawaii office was the, was the suspicion on Mr. Kuhn, amongst other things. But also, since there was a war with Japan, um, they were starting to create dossiers, probably on numerous individuals, of which we don't know their names. And if we filed a Freedom of Information Act request, doesn't necessarily mean that we would find it. <coughs> um, anyway, so this is the memo. It's got... Kuhn, he's in Oahu at Kaloya. He's got a wife, daughter, age 22, son, 15, that's Eberhard. Daughter is Ruth Carson Moore, um, son of five, and another son that's obviously older, that's married, age 26, that's in the Nazi Bureau. And the brief is that Mr. Kuhn, the advanced student of Japanese, uh, entertains lavishly army officers, no apparent source of income, owns two homes, one's very large. Uh, no, They don't know why he's there, or mysterious length of stay, and reason for residing in Hawaii, and, and they defend Hitler in a clever manner. And this is pre-war. Japan and Germany were allies, but we were not yet at war with both Germany and Japan, but there was a, um, a feeling in the country that they were aggressive nations that very well in, may end up dragging us into war. And so it was, you know, a scare from a far-off place. And then on May 9th, this was May 1st, so it was about two weeks later, um, someone that worked at the Minnesota <laughs> office of the FBI um, wrote back um, to someone... Um, this is written on May 1st about a conversation that took place on May 1st <coughs> that um, he's going to confirm that he had a conversation by long distance telephone <coughs> by Mr. Mr. X here informed agent that there is a German couple whose name he doesn't recall living near Honolulu so, you know, he doesn't have this memo in front of him. <laughs> um, 
living near Honolulu, the hot island of Oahu, territory of Hawaii, who are known to be who are known to be German agents, and who are looked on by the naval, naval intelligence as being German spies, that naval intelligence officers have been endeavoring for the past three years to trace the source of funds of this German couple, that the couple has large sums of money at their command and are buying property in the island of Oahu near Honolulu, maintain a ref residence there and entertain frequently and lavishly and that their guests are usually army officers and their wives, actually Navy, but whatever, and who are stationed at various forts located within 25 miles of Honolulu and naval officers and their wives who are stationed at Pearl Harbor. It has been apparent for a long time that the purpose of this couple in the entertainment of army and navy personnel is to secure as much information regarding the secrets and movements in the army and navy as they can. That within the past year, a high naval officer in the intelligence branch of the Navy spent considerable time in Honolulu endeavoring to get evidence of the source of the funds which the people, couple have, but they have as yet been unsuccessful in securing this information that they likewise have not learned the purpose of which property is being bought by the couple on the island of, of Oahu. And uh, Blank gave the foregoing information to the agent in conference. Now, why the hell? I don't know why they're calling St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, obviously, this is a lot more extravagant of, of a description, and it, it actually is what it ended up being the accusations were <laughs> than the short brief that was supplied in that memo there. Um, and then there's someone that can undoubtedly give the name. And this is out of date order because <laughs> that's May. And we're back in February, so I had that out of order. Now, if someone wrote from somewhere, now this is J. Edgar Hoover, that I've been advised by a source which has not previously furnished information to the Bureau that Mr. and Mrs. Kuhn of Kaluro, Ohio, may be SBN agents in the Hawaiian Islands. You can see how the rumor grows. It is stated that <coughs> Mr. and Mrs. Kuhn have a daughter of 22 years of age, two minor sons, in addition to their older son, who's employed in the Nazi Bureau in Berlin. The Kuhns have two homes in the Hawaiian Islands, entertained lavishly. Particularly army officers who have no apparent source of income. They're described as mysterious and as the reason to be in the Hawaiian Islands and length of the stay there. Kuhn is described as being an advanced student of Japanese language. It's just a reiteration thrown in the file to, to start docking up a dossier. The Bureau has no special agent in the Hawaiian Islands at this present time. It is contemplated the agent will be in the Honolulu in the near future. While in the Hawaiian Islands, the agent will conduct a discreet investigation to ascertain whatever information is possible concerning the cons. Anyway, it's another letter. The Bureau has been advised by... <laughs> so one's written to the special agent in charge. Another one's written to Mr. Blank. You know, he's got a name, he gets dotted out. Um, oh, God. Dear sir, it's different. This bureau has been advised by an anonymous source that Mr. McCombe from Kuala Ohio may be SBN agents in the Hawaiian Islands. The bureau has been advised that the Cones own two homes, which are very large, entertained lavishly. Army officers, it is stated, they have no apparent source of income. And that their son is employed in the Navy Bureau in Nazi Bureau in Berlin, and Mr. Kuhn is an advanced student of the Japanese language. You know, doesn't mean anything until 1942. This information has already been furnished to the headquarters of the Army and Navy Intelligence in Washington. It is desired that when an agent is next in the Hawaiian appropriate, discreet inquiry be made whether Kuhn's are fact espionage. Okay, so at least he has some doubt. All right, so let me go back to the St. Paul guy. In fact, this is the same one. I printed this twice, so this, this one shouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, I'll move it right here. Okay. So then we got the, the graduated story from St. Paul, Minnesota in May. Then we have this um, memorandum from Mr. Tam. Um, this is an individual, Mr. X, who... I, who says he called the St. Paul, Minnesota office and advised him that it was my understanding that, that he possessed inf information concerning a baron or baroness who entertained 
various officials at Pearl Harbor advised that he did have information relative to the German man. <laughs> That's a lie. Um, and he didn't say that in his memo. And his wife in Honolulu are trying to buy up land in the island of Oahu, of which Pearl Harbor and Honolulu are located, and these individuals have been entertaining Army and Navy officials for several years. He stated he did not know whether these individuals were baron or baroness. <coughs> no record of that inquiry on the other one. Um, this is the Washington, D.C. office. Stated that as he understood it, these individuals only purpose to entertain these officials. You know, what is this? No, no, no. The guy in, in Minnesota, when he wrote back, said that, I understand you just called me and you told me all this stuff. I'm verifying you told me all this stuff. And then this person is saying, not saying that he told him a bunch of stuff, but that the guy in Minnesota told him stuff. It, you know, it's just crosstalk. You know, okay, so the dossier grows. Slowly the, the charges evolve into something, and all they really have is a second-hand memo and a meaningless conversation with an agent in, in Minnesota. <laughs> the closest field office is in San Francisco, but let's get back to this. He stated he didn't know whether the individuals were Baron or Baroness. Blank stated that as he understood it, these individuals only purpose were entertaining these officials to question them and to find out what they can as the Army and Navy operations are secrets. He stated this man and woman have plenty of money, and the naval intelligence has been trying to trace the source of their money for the past few years, but has been unable to yet successfully ascertain exactly where the money comes from, but they suspect the money comes from some source in China. That's brand new, not in the other one. Uh, stated that naval intelligence has some high official from Washington in Honolulu working on this case in the past year. He stated he did not recall the official's name, but thought it was blank. Uh, Vi's source of information on this matter was blank. He stated that blank was also stated that it was his understanding that whatever. Vi's, he did not recall the names of the two German couple in question. Okay, so it's, it, it's like they're both, it's crosstalk. It's bullshit. You're putting stuff in a dossier and you're making shit up as you go, basically. Or maybe they had heard some things. I mean, some of the things is, did get verified. But now, but now we got this, this gem here. A letter written on May 9 is discussing a phone call that will take place the next day. In accordance with your request, I called the Naval Office of Naval Intelligence relative to the identity of the German man, a woman residing in Honolulu, who, according to Blank, are supposed to be entertaining lavishly officers in the Army and Navy and who are, who are indicated as being German agents, as if they are. Blank stated that that their information is filed according to names of individuals, in view of which he would not have to make a complete search of his files relative to this matter. On the morning of May 9th, Blank called and stated that he had forwarded the information concerning a Mr. and Mrs. Cohn, who are residing in Hawaii in Honolulu and who were alleged to be German agents and lavish or native officers. Blank stated that he had forwarded this information to a Honolulu had not received a report reflecting the results of the investigation. All right, May 3rd. So it's just, you know, we're just, every once in a while, these think about this spy agents and, you know, you know puff up the story a little bit. <clears throat> In accordance with your instructions, the writer called Mr. Hotel, the Washington Field Office, and related to him that it was the director's desire to make overtures to the Office of Naval Intelligence for the purpose of identifying the names of the man and woman in Honolulu who are addressed alleged to be German agents and okay. Um, so we just want to know what their names are basically. I advise the writer that the only information in the possession of the Office of Naval Intelligence pertaining to, pertain to Mr. and Mrs. Cohn which he had previously furnished to it, and then he had ascertained that a report would be forthcoming concerning the matter for the near future, at which time well supplies with the desired information will be forwarded to the director. So, who's, who is writing from the... <laughs> this seems to be Mr. Hotel here. Wrote, th wrote this thing. 
Maybe. I, you know, who knows? Or it's one of these completely redacted documents that are abundant in this file. And May 23rd, war, reiteration, and, and you know, a bunch of redacted stuff. I'm transmitting a copy of this man around to the New York and, field, and San Francisco field offices for the purpose of obtaining information of the activities of blank. It is recalled that blank furnished you with information concerning alleged espionage of Mr. Ms. Coon and the Hawaiian Islands and further have received information relative to the activities of German man and woman at the Hawaiian Islands and obtained lavishly the Army Navy officers believe Mr. Coon and with these individuals. Now, now they got another memo. They're writing, well, let's make sure that the man they're talking about, let's give an excuse to put another piece of paper in this thick dossier. <laughs> you know, is, is Mr. Coon Mr. and Mrs. Coon? Because this person didn't remember who is Mr. and Mrs. Coon. And then we get all this stuff blanked out for God knows what reason. For the information of the New York office, it may be stated, it's the 24th, that I have been advised by a source which has not previously furnished information to the Bureau that Mr. and Mrs. Cooner Kalua, Ohio, may be SBN agents in the... Okay. Then, a couple months pass, and it's July now. They, they're, they have a pointlessly thick... Um, Repetitive file that lacks content, but you know they're they're building their dossier, which is their goal. You know it's machinery. They finally get an answer from the War Department, directed to Lieutenant Colonel J. Edgar Hoover, which doesn't make any sense. He's not a colonel, never was. And he says, in reply to your letter of July 6, 1939, with reference to one Otto Kuhn, please be advised that this office has no record of him. So we got a rumor. Secondhand rumor thrown into the file, phone calls between offices to advise the other office that the other office told the first office what the other office, you know, things that are impossible. <laughs> Name forgetting, you know, okay. Um, <clears throat> then on July 18th, someone writes back to someone. Um, Someone got the letter from the War Department and is now reporting on the letter. In accordance with your request of the Washington Field Office, the writer called Blank of the Office of Naval Intelligence, and he relayed that no additional information other than the data set forth in their memorandum dated July 15, 1939. Mr. Called to both named individuals and family are believed to be engaged in joint espionage activities in Honolulu. I thank Blank for his courtesy and calling these data to the attention of the Bureau. <laughs> what data? He said they didn't have anything. On May 15th, where it's completely redacted, if it exists. So now August comes around. This is kind of dying here. A month passes. Um, now there's... NJL Piper, don't know what he does, never heard of him, but he's not redacted, but he, since he's a special agent, I guess he doesn't get redacted, <clears throat> and he just decides to write, inasmuch as the Honolulu Field Division is being reopened effective August 23rd, 1939, Honolulu is being made the office of origin of this case, and the entire file of this office is being transmitted to you, Hearth with, and the case is being considered as referred upon a police and office of origin. All right, then we get this heavily redacted whatever. Mr. and Mrs. Coon reported to have rented a house in Hawaii to entertain arm, army officers lavishly, and they had no current source of income. They were said to be evasive regarding their income and the duration of their stay in the island. They reported to have a 20-year-old daughter, two sons of a minor age, and an older son who's employed by the Nazi Bureau in Berlin. There's another highly redacted document, of which only page two is meaningful to print. For the information of the Honolulu office, the first information received from the San Francisco office was a letter, <laughs> one of the repetitive letters that I previously read. Uh, on this case is a letter from the Bureau dated February 11th, 1939, in which advised Mr. and Mrs. Kuhn of Kua, uh, might be espionage in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, they own two homes, and they 
entertained lavishly, particularly army officers. It was reported they have no apparent source of income that one of their sons was employed by the Nazis in Berlin. Okay, now here's New York City. Checking in. Source of information will indicate Mr. Ms. Kuhn lived in Hawaii for most of the time since August 15, 1935. And until recently very well on the money report obtained from Amsterdam. Uh, what? <laughs> How do they know that? Because, <laughs> you know... He did say the money came out of Amsterdam. He had a bank account there, and his inheritance was stored in the Amsterdam. Yeah. Who told them that? <laughs> Probably in one of the redacted documents in which someone... Um, documented how he violated the guy's um, privacy rights. Kuhn's privacy rights were violated by the bank. In the FBI window, let's just read this. Um, through a New York bank, but all information now indicates the Coons are in finan dire financial circumstances. The Coons have been entertained in Honolulu lavishly, <laughs> extensively, and appear to have sought companionship in young naval officers. Information indicates Coons formerly in the German Navy and is reported to have been discharged some for same in 1929 for financial irregularities, which is not true, as far as I know, where they get that from. We have no documents to show where they got that. Um, it was not received cordially by members of crew of German cruiser Emden when the ship was in Honolulu. Kuhn was, has indicated his family life becoming unbearable due to his wife's Nazi attitude. Okay, so basically... Um, they're keeping track of his conversations and throwing it into this file as if this is not new information but repeated <coughs> his son named Leopold is active in Nazi circles <coughs> so now what in, ended up happening is and yeah, in 1930, as he said, <laughs> wasn't able to get his money out of um, the Netherlands anymore and had to sell his house. And um, according to what Kuhn said, and that uh, his wife had to make, broker some business deal with a family friend who did business in Shanghai to sell something she owned over there in Germany because she wouldn't be able to actually take the money out of Germany and um, <laughs> and this is telling you know th these are Nazi officers <laughs> nonetheless or, or Nazi officers that are not receiving him cordially details. The title of this case has changed to show correct spelling. So the last name set forth the name and initial. At Honolulu, Territory of Hawaii. The file of confidential informant, informant N has been reviewed in connection with this case and pertinent information is being set forth briefly herewith. The Bureau has advised by a separate ledger as to the identity of confidential informant N. So before, he was anonymous. Now he's confidential informant N and his his identity will be revealed later on. <laughs> I'm fairly certain. Because there were some unredacted con uh, documents that were published by Congress that reveal that to us. So now we, we get the whole history of this guy. <laughs> um, confidential informant's been taking notes, you know. Otto Kuhn is a native and citizen of Germany, having been born in Berlin July 25th, 1895. He is reported to have served in the German Navy during World War as an officer. Information indicates he was on the ship Blucher when it was sank during the war and was picked up by His Majesty's ship Lion and turned in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland, where he remained till the end of the war and returned to Germany. After the war, he ran for some time in the German Navy and it was and has been reported he was dismissed from the Navy in 1929 for alleged financial difficulties. Who reported that to them? I don't know. 
This is just some information that confidential informant N has been able to gather, but not tell us where he gets the information from. That's okay, so we have a dossier and we gotta build it, so let's start typing. Subsequent to the war, he married one Friedel Burke on May 10th, 1920 at Munich, Germany, and I can't confirm that. This woman is reported to have been the widow of a German officer killed in the war. This woman had a son, Leopold, who was reported to be a secretary of one of the most important of the important Nazi leaders in Germany. He also has a daughter, Ruth, who is presently in Honolulu. Age about 23, and two sons have been born to the marriage of Reynald Alcun, 113 and one other nine. The Kuhn family, until just recently, appeared to have ample and considerable funds, which were transmitted to them from a New York bank, from a bank in Amsterdam, where at the present time the funds seem to have been depleted or else the transmission of the same has been interrupted inasmuch as the Coons appear to be in financial dire financial straits as premiums on insurance policies from Germany indicate that they have not been paid. So someone's looking through their mail. Also because of the fact that Kuhn, and that's the property, that's his wife's property. Also because of the fact that Kuhn is arranging at the present time to teach classes in German at the Honolulu YMCA, it should be noted that in 1936 when the German cruiser Emden was in, Honolulu the ship's doctor, gave out information you know, if they're going to say he's a Nazi, they better make sure he's a fucking Nazi, you know instead they're saying the ship's doctor gave out information that the officers of the Emden were not to have anything to do with Kuhn. Kuhn arrived on, in Honolulu August 15, 1935, having departed from Germany April 18, 1935, and temporarily lived in the Brooklyn Hotel where he sought the companionship of young Navy officers and was reported to have entertained them freely. Elizabeth's associates will be set forth subsequently in this report. Kuhn gave us his reason for being in Honolulu, his desire to study the Japanese language, which is he consistently said later in his confession, with the intention of qualifying himself to hold and work as an interpreter or translator in the position of the mercantile field in his native country, so he's unaware. That probably changed. I, I don't see why, according to Kuhn's story, he would um, believe he was safe to return to his country. However, since he has applied for the first for first papers in this country, it appears that this reason no longer exists. Okay, good. Some informants in indicate Kuhn's expenditures have amounted to approximately 500 per month, and it appears Mr. Kuhn, Mrs. Kuhn has money in her own right. Yes, she does. The following extraction is quoted from the Honolulu Advertiser, March 4th, 1938, under the Captain Court happenings. Husband and wife, the daughter, all of which came to the United States last year from Germany, filed yesterday in the offices of William Thompson, clerk of the Biddle Court, the declaration contempt citizens of the city that the declarant or Otto Kuhn, born in Berlin, Fredel Kuhn, Hamburg, Ruth Kuhn, born in Berlin, the Kuhn's living on some avenue in Oahu. Kuhn has been suspected by some Germans of having supplied information to the Japanese government. Now, what the fuck is that? <laughs> what the fuck is I mean what that's strange. But that, that really kind of breaks things up. I mean, when you look at this in hindsight, you think to yourself, well, the Japanese and the Germans were, you know, being far removed from, it was, how many years ago was World War II? 70 years now, and um, just about. And um, the one thing that sticks in people's minds is that the Germans and Japanese were allies. But they really had a non-aggression pact. They just promised not to attack each other. They didn't fight in the trenches between themselves. And it is more realistic that the Germans may worry about Kuhn giving away information to the Japanese, but I don't think he'd be in a position to have any information. I mean, he basically, you know, as the later documents will show, he did... Um, play tango with the devil in an attempt to in his desperation for money earn a living as a Nazi informant and was uh, later thrown into concentration camp because of his poor performance but he's openly stated that he obtained information that he 
informant in obtained information that of Honolulu intended to ascertain the correct status of Otto Kohn in Germany. So apparently this informant believes they could find out whether Otto Kuhn is persona non grata <laughs> or the opposite. Uh, on July 14, 1938, Mr. Miss Kuhn, two youngest boys, <coughs> <coughs> left <coughs> Honolulu on <coughs> the Taitu Moor for Yokohama, and that's correct. I actually have a, the pastor list matches that. And Kuhn announced the purpose of the visit was namely to obtain entry permits for his two youngest children upon his re-entry into this country. And his two children were at the time that is in the U.S. on temporary permits. Should, there's some weird shit they had to do to, to be able to stay in the country. Should be noted that the Kuhns at this time listed their names as follows. Otto Kuhn as Friedel Kuhn. Okay, on September, Otto Kuhn returned from Yokohama on the Asama Maru, which is correct, because I saw the pastor was, <coughs> and gave as his Japanese address the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. I see. Miss Riedel Kuhn, Ruth Kuhn, and Hans Kuhn returned upon the Chichu Maru in November 1938. How many years was that? few months later. It is estimated the minimum expenses for this trip is approximately seven hundred dollars. Yeah, well he had ten thousand, so go figure. It should be pointed out that when Miss Kuhn and her family cons concerning of Ruth and two of his boys arrived in Honolulu in November they had four thousand yen and hundred yen notes, which would be approximately twelve hundred dollars. Appears the Japanese law states that three hundred yen is a large amount anybody could take from Japan, so kind of it implies that the Japanese government are letting them get away with things they're not allowed to because they're special. <laughs> or it could be they just didn't tell the Japanese they had that much money. <laughs> or maybe, oh, yeah, they wouldn't be able to divide it between the four of them. <coughs> Kuhn has made the statement that his wife has made life unbearable due to her Nazi attitude. <coughs> and there was some information to indicate Miss Kuhn has made very different statements concerning Nazi conditions in Germany in the presence of guests, at which time Kuhn appears to be embarrassed. Okay, there's some confirmation, again, of him not being a Nazi, not comfortable with the idea, but he has to live with the fact that his wife's son by a different marriage is a Nazi stormtrooper. <laughs> his actions appear not to be Right. Is if he's gonna believe you? <coughs> I mean, that it just makes no sense. It makes no sense. Um, that's just paranoia. I mean, I, what, what the his actions may or may not be genuine. Let me explain why I think that doesn't make any sense. First of all, when his wife makes these statements about the Nazis, um, made these statements, the cat's already out of the bag. You know, why wouldn't they think she's the spy and he's not under those conditions it makes more sense that he fled Germany for his life as he later states <laughs> and has this one little annoying thing about his relationship with his wife and, and the fact that you know her she not only has a son in the stormtroopers so is going to emotionally support him on a personal level but on a superficial level, she seems to be, you know, um, rooting for the, the the leader, you know, not the leader, but what appears to be a successful campaign of destruction by the Germans only because they are succeeding, but not because of the details, which is an argument I make. On June 15, 1939, uh, Friedel Kuhn opened an, an account in her own name at the Bishop's National Bank of Honolulu with an initial deposit of 1800 which time she made the statement that she had spent 30000 since coming to Hawaii and that she was opening an account in her name so they could not get any more of her money. So what happened? <coughs> she, she sounds like she's a little bit... Um, she's 
selfish somewhat or, or you know if some if Bernard so what happened is Bernard Kuhn arrived in Hawaii first with, with his aunt's inheritance and bought the properties that are in question eventually having to sell one of them um and she's framing the money he spent as hers. <laughs> now, however, this eighteen hundred dollars is, um, if I remember the sequence correctly, is actually perhaps funds from the six thousand dollar down payment that she got for selling her property in Germany, um, which is not clear here yet. Um, and they probably had to spend the rest on paying for stuff to live on. <laughs> it is not known to whom she referred as they, that's Mr. Mr. Kuhn, although it may be her husband, yeah, since it is known that he invested several thousand dollars in the furniture business in Honolulu and subsequently went broke. That, that explains it. So her down payment went to starting a business and they thought they would, because they, they can't trust whether this guy's going to deliver cash from as far as they know, the six thousand dollars all they're going to get. So hedge their bets. They try to start their own business, but they, they lost it. They lost it. So she had to go back to demand the money again, and she got some. Um, <coughs> may may also be. And since since Con was driving with one blah 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 blah, probably some woman was. When Khan, when he was had an auto accident, at which time Miss Kuhn was absent from Honolulu. The list of Kuhn's associates all blacked out. And then we got um, another memorandum. This is October now. So they revived a case. That, you know, I don't know why this is coming out of New York City, but a case that was mostly dead has now come back to life in September. Probably because um, the Germans were on the brink of attacking Poland, if not, they already had. <laughs> All right, now here's October. Um, in a letter date, it's 16 October 1939, which is not here. Um, from blah, blah, blah of New England Mutual Life Insurance and addressed to Mr. and Mr. Otto Kuhn. Called to contention of the balance doing the Buick policy. $31.25. Right now he's broke and Mrs. Kuhn's has the $1,800, but is going to go back to Japan, I, I bet, fairly soon. In fact, where's, where's, her, where's her passenger? There's her passenger list. We've got her going there in 1936, 1937, 40 and 41. 37, probably with her husband. Let's see. Let's go back to this. <clears throat> He was there in 1935. 1938, they were just going there to get passports. But she's not even on the list. <laughs> um, And I don't have her going to, I don't have her on her pastor list till 1940. So the money that was left over from 1937, or she probably also got money from the down payment when they went in 1938 here. I thought I had the wrong date. Tayu Matsu.
It was 15 September 1938. Not July. <coughs> or at least I don't have a record of that. Um, so before they left, so she must have had, I don't know what's going on with her. November 1938. <laughs> September. So they must, I don't have record of, I didn't find the pastor to listen to them coming out, but them coming back. She must have had, they must have had more money than they showed. <laughs> Down payment, I can't really exactly make sense of that. <clears throat> but anyway, this thing is mostly dead. Now it's come back to life. Let's see now. Um, then there's some. And whoever it is calls the attention of the Coons the balance the 31 and the Buick policy <coughs> 1939 you know she went back in 1940 probably get some money from the man who bought her property <laughs> in June I made an arrangement with Mrs. Coon that I would but let's look at his let's actually look at his confession let's find out So in 1935, he just, 1934, he was no longer a member of the Nazi party. In 1935, he started to write articles, and he finally gave up. Um, with regard to the income, Growing the monies which are received from time to time from the outside sources, which he goes doesn't talk about the way down here. After the, uh, he only had ten marks when he left Germany in 1935. Um, but he had a small account, and in 1934 he received a thirty-five thousand dollar inheritance. It wasn't until 1940 after this, so the money ran out. The 35000 finally ran out from 1934 until 1939. And they were just stupid with their money. And he wasn't actually able to get it all out. He finally was cut off at the pass in 1938, which is before the Germans arrived, so I don't understand that. Um, but he bought some property and then he ended up having to, to sell one of them and then finally <laughs> in 1939 the, the money started to get low and they started talking about Mrs. Kuhn actually having to come up with some money herself maybe sell the property that was in Germany and there's 30000 of her money Her money. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then um, she took 1800 of it and put it in the bank. And um, then finally she was going to go get this money from Hamburg. But this was not until 1940. So, yeah, they were broke during late 1939. And apparently Mrs. Coombe wasn't willing to take the money out of her bank account, so, um, um, I guess, I don't know, maybe they used it up finally, and then she decided to go over to, because, you know, they got three houses going for 
God knows what reason. And then, um, then she decided to sell her property in Germany. And, he, and Dr. Homburg is the man, and he advanced the money to her. References made to your letter of August 14th, 1939. They just carry around a lot of cash. They didn't. <clears throat> addressed to the Honolulu, advising that the entire file in the same is being transmitted to Honolulu. That you. Oh, yeah. It is noted that you, when you wrote me, you failed to indicate copies of that letter for the New York office, resulting in the failure of the New York office to furnish Honolulu copies of the report. Some other days, just. I thought this was kind of strange. Um, I thought something funny was going on, but nothing came of it. It seems like something funny is going on, but really, they're they have this. They're so they push themselves so hard to advocate and fill up a dossier and with pointless repetition and <laughs> an unfounded, you know, additional details to add. Maybe. Maybe the other redacted pages have them, um, and are, have been redacted pointlessly. I don't know, um, but nonetheless, okay. Whatever. Supposedly, some papers didn't make it to the office. And, okay, so now here is under date the agent contacted conference form at San Francisco. The management record indicated there's no additional information. Okay, great. That's a waste of time. Oh, what that is, is they responded back. There's no other letters. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay, so then memorandum for the director written by Tam. Some months ago, residing on the West Coast, first information concerning the activities in Honolulu of Mr. and Mrs. Kuhn, as if they're true, who have been the subject of some investigation by the Bureau. Well, this is just more fluffery. It's, it's, it's just repetitive. And the words of some confidential informant, one interview and one anonymous letter. Um, appear to be obviously engaged in espionage on behalf of the German government. Oh, yeah, really. <laughs> it's not obvious. In fact, some of the information they have from the confidential informant coincides with what he says in his confession. And letter back, reference to many of the memorandum, Captain Manners, rotation. Better let Sheevers know and also. ONI, please be advised that the information contained in the reference memorandum has been incorporated in the investigative report. All right, whatever. Um, just paperwork to say they're moving paperwork. Honolulu, March, this is March 7th, 1940. We're getting closer. Uh, Mrs. Kuhn would have, let's see, according to this confession here, would she have got her money yet? Spring, uh, just about. She's getting ready to go. She's knowledge with thanks for your letter of March fifth, nineteen forty, and closing report dated March fourth, relating to the research person baggage. Okay, so so um, she was aboard the President Coolidge on February nineteenth, nineteen forty, and her lag her luggage was searched on this suspicion. <laughs> They used the Customs Bureau as their excuse, who cooperated. And, and then this thing here in March says that Otto Kuhn was interviewed by a confidential informant and which time he claimed which time he claimed not to be in sympathy with present German government, as if it's false. Despite the other statements, despite the embarrassment statement. Uh, but declined to work for informant N due to his relatives being in Germany. Uh, her efforts, her effects were searched by custom officers at the same time. Wow. <laughs> okay, so then are we repeating what was said before? Um, confidential informant furnished a memorandum to the effect that Autocum. had called at the office of confidential informant, at which time Subject Otto Kuhn stated that he had been a member of the Nazi party, but later when Hitler came to power it was necessary for him to get out of Germany and he did not agree with the new government. This time Kuhn advised that he had been in the 
naval service to Germany and been held prisoner by the British during the past World War. <coughs> he further stated that he owned property, in, and they were still not at war yet. He further stated that he owned property in Germany from which he derived an income, but at the present time he was unable to get the money out of Germany. They had made <coughs> an arrangement with the prospective son-in-law, Dr. Homburg, of Kobe, Japan, where Homburg was forwarding money to, you know, Mr. Homburg didn't marry a daughter of his. <laughs> he didn't have a daughter to marry. Um, but he was probably worried about the quizzing this guy was doing, so maybe he made that part up. Um, anyway, forwarding his money to him at Honolulu, and he was transferring a similar amount to Homburg's credit in Germany. Well, the way that was happening was through the sale of her property. He stated that Dr. Homburg expected to marry his daughter, Ruth, and she, oh, she didn't, okay. After the first of the year, but there was unable to marry for a period of five years from the death of the previous wife who had jumped overboard the steamer in the Red Sea. I see. Well, wait not, want not, I suppose. Confidential informant N asked Subject Kuhn if he intended to follow through with his naturalization, replied that he had hoped to become an American citizen. While he lived in the German, he loved the German people. He had no sympathy for the present German government. And when asked if he was willing to assist, confidential informant gaining information concerning un American activities on the part of Germans, <laughs> that would scare me if I were him. He advised that he would not accept such a job for pay. But if any such information came to his attention, he would inform the confidential informant. He stated that he had very little contact with local Germans. Subject Otto Kuhn also stated that his son and other relatives were still in Germany and that he could not afford to let it be known that he was performing any services against Germany, which is, which is true. Uh, he doesn't want his son to die. And also, I'll go into this. As part of his testimony, <laughs> his confession, or whatever you want to call it, um... Mr. Kuhn, he he doesn't go into. I don't think he went into this detail. He may have, and maybe it may be redacted pointlessly. You know who knows. Um, he he was unemployed and desperate in need of a job, and so he got a job with the, the Nazi Party. And he went down to spy on some, as it will be revealed in his um, testimony, um, some police department in some city somewhere in Germany outside Berlin, you know, where the party was. And his job was to figure out who was loyal to the Nazis and who was not and report back. And I, you know, I'm, I don't have any evidence to support this, but I, except for the fact that he was promptly fired when he came back to submit his report. And what, what I derive from that is that he probably came back with an empty list of of bad guys, he didn't. He didn't like doing that. Over and now, it, now someone's asking him to do it in America. So, d despite the very good reasons that are being cited here, at least from anybody of conscious. Um, <laughs> additionally, um, you know, in, an individual has already experienced that kind of ethical dilemma is not going to want to get into it again. But I, if I were Mr. Kuhn, I would be shocked at this point. <laughs> I'd be worried. <laughs> the, you know, now, you know, it doesn't matter what country he goes to, it seems to be that, you know, spying on a country's own citizen seems to be the fashion of every nation in the world. Okay. Then on February 19, 1940, Fredel Kuhn departed from Honolulu aboard the Coolidge. Yeah, and this was to get some money for her to make arrangements with Dr. Homburg. He probably, who we probably very well believe was going to marry his daughter um, to get some money out of Germany through the sale of his wife's property. Okay, um, and in route to Japan, 
And what does she get? She gets her privacy violated and her, her personal belongings searched. You know, she's left Germany to escape this kind of thing, and she gets it in her new land of the free and home of the brave, giving her poor huddled masses yearning to be free and let's search their luggage. And she should have been alarmed because when she arrived back from her trip, she would have discovered the items missing from her luggage. And she was very puzzled as to why it was. Um, and these items include, because custom officials delivered, the customs office cooperated with the FBI on this one, and delivered to the Honolulu office a number of clippings and telephone directory, which clippings and directory were examined by blah, 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 and appear to be no prefer, perforations in them, and they did not appear to have been written with any secret ink. However, they are not processed for the same. The clippings appear to have been cut from the Honolulu Advertiser, where a series of articles written by someone about American Polynesia uh, describing various American e and English islands. The Honolulu Telephone Directory is examined, and the only markings were noted on page one, the name, some name, probably a friend of hers. Um, And then they just say they're going to maintain <laughs> in contact with confidential informant M for developing further information, making the file bigger, and violating their rights. And then we get to March 1940. Um, records the. Uh, <laughs> then they go to the court now to see that they actually filed the declaration, and they did, and they got all this personal information from the from the declaration on the forms. Um, we have names of the children, wife, husband, daughter, where they were born, when they got married, all of which are probably nothing materially different than what confidential informants already gathered on them, but it makes the file thicker, I suppose. Um, which is actually not good. I'm against that. <coughs> and then they repeat this in the summary. We'll, we'll maintain friendship with confidential informant N, who is... Okay, then we get this weird article. <laughs> January... Second, 1941, and it clearly is retaliation for confidential informant N is now worried that he that he showed his hand to, to Bernard Kuhn <laughs> or or the or the the anonymous tipster is pissed that Mr. Kuhn is still around, but nonetheless. Um, an article appeared in the January 2nd, 1941 issue of the Hawaii Sentinel, which which does refer to Bernard Nara Kuhn. It no, as I said before, no subordinate subordinating covert agent is going to place an article like this in the newspaper <laughs> for anybody that they don't want to be get in trouble. And if there were Nazi agents in the area, this certainly would cause people to look for them rather than do anything to provide for their additional safety. So this is obviously an assassination attempt. Let's see how far I've gone here now. So this article appeared in January 2nd, 1941 issue of the Hawaii Sentinel, which I haven't been able to retrieve the original of. There's a microfilm in Hawaii that it's not online. Junius would like 
to know when the deportation of the local Nazi family, <laughs> who carry names similar to the fellow who got the front page with the mainland Bund activities, there we go, so there is mention of the Bund, Kuhn is going to be announced official, officially. We hear their house set up with the bar for the servicemen to get them in the mood to talk was a tip off as to just what the little lady of the trio was up to and they're playing around with the local gold braid boys, whatever that means. We hear the import Jack has been cut to a minimum and his Berlin boss is transferring them to the Shanghai Bund. This is obviously a confidential informant and no one has this kind of detail. Junius hears that the FBI has one swell dossier on this setup and the family is set to get a turn down reception if they try to stop off at Manila. That's just a scare tactic. Whether he ever saw that, we don't know, but they still put it in there. Then they repeat the the contents of the immigration nationalization file. Um, he's a student. Wife is Frida Kuhn. They're from Lanakai, Oahu. Chilton Brew. Martin Eberhard, who eventually is age 10. And Hans Joshin, age 3. Otto Kuhn is born in Berlin, Germany. He has a passport number from Germany, issued in Berlin, 1935. That corresponds with the story. To expire on 1940, Kuhn to the United States is not an immigrant. 1935, Honolulu is admitted for 12 months. Extension was granted to August 1937. The reason given being to continue Japanese studies. The statement was made by Otokun. He was not employed, but had ample funds. Yes, we know about the inheritance. Income was noted as derived from investments. Now that I, I would like to see, but um, it was noted that Otto Kuhn married Friedel Burke at, at Mansion, Germany. Otto Kuhn was later admitted on 1936. Quote, immigrant aboard the Tatsuya Maru. December 2nd, 1935, another statement made by Otto Kuhn. In fact, he arrived in New York City on April 29th to transmit to Japan via Honolulu for purpose of studying Japanese language. That corresponds with the story. Um, intention of qualifying in such to hold an interpreter and translator position in the mercantile field in Germany. It was stated he arrived, he changed his mind obviously, uh, in Japan June 18th and determined after investigation he could make better progress in his endeavor to learn Japanese at the University of Hawaii. Uh, then returned to Hawaii 1935 and since his attended the university and his ride in the Brooklyn Hotel this notarized statement was moved to the American Council at Yokohama in order that Oda's daughter Ruth could visit him in Honolulu. This is part of the trip they were talking about earlier. More stuff uh, Kuhn brought with him at the time number of private papers, which proved conclusively that he was a man of means. His income was from state investments. Amounted to approximately 5000 a year. Well, okay, I didn't know about that, but okay. <laughs> uh, Kuhn said he expected his wife and child to join Germany and remain there approximately one year, at which time his family returned to Germany. Um, he probably estimated that the money he had in the bank would yield him 5000 a year. 30000 5000 that seems a bit high. So it was probably just an estimate. I Maybe fabricate. you could say, well, maybe it was fabricated, but I, people put numbers on forms they don't understand all the time based on their hopes and wishes and not reality. On November 1st, 1938, Otto Kuhn, who had also departed from Japan July 1938, returned to Honolulu, uh, Honolulu on September 22nd, 1938. And that sounds a little bit more consistent with the record I have from Ancestry. God damn, there it is. It's the 22nd, so they finally got it right. Check the records, the U.S. District Clerk's Office, uh, no further information from the National Proceedings with regard to Otto Friedel and Ruth, then previously set forth. 
It might be pointed out that five years of residence of car system can be attained, therefore Otto will be eligible for citizenship. Oh, God, no. That, God forbid that in October 1941 and in September 1942, they'll have their citizenship. Information report indicates Ruth in her final papers uh, following her marriage to an American citizen. All this information is not recorded. So the plans didn't work out with their friend over in Japan. This is now 1941. Now we're in November. So I'm going to stop here and then continue.